Right, so uh, w- welcome to, uh, to Bench Talk uh, 101. Um, obviously, as you all know, this was set up uh, because of COVID, about meeting each other um, or trying to keep the conversation going um, whilst we were um, self-isolating. Um, but, but this week's been quite a, a monumental week, actually, because uh, as our country's starting to gain its confidence and reopen, um, we at the, the college actually reopened this week and we had our first learners coming in on Monday. And I know that Derek's been in there delivering live lessons on, on Tuesday. And uh, it's been a, a really quite a, uh, uh, an interesting, um, if not stressful, week, uh, making sure that all the risk assessments and everything was correct. So, uh, so we're on that route of coming out of lockdown. Um, and, uh, you know, what's, what's really interesting is the comments and the emails that I've been receiving about Bench Talk. Um, and, and some of those comments are sort of saying, you know, even when we come out of, of, of lockdown um, or when COVID's over, you know, please, can you keep it going? Um, this is a great format um, and, and it will be good to, 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 to you know, keep it going. Um, the only way we're going to keep it going, though, is if we, if we all support it um, and we encourage more people to speak. Um, and maybe some of you help out the role of the admin side of it, um, you know, trying to promote it and, and get those sides going because, uh, you know, uh, um, I'm, I will be back in at work full on and therefore it will be very difficult for me to, 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 to continue. So um, over the last few weeks, we've had um, several speakers. Um, a lot of them have been talking about 17th and 18th century hand tools. Um, but tonight's speaker, we're, we're going to go back in time. We're going to go way back. We're going to actually go 1,500 to 2,000 years back in time, and we're going to talk about ancient hand planes. Now, this is um, something that absolutely fascinated me because the first time I met Richard um, was actually at the college down at the, the London Design and Engineering UTC, um, and we we were basically hosting a um, uh, the London International Woodworking Festival, and it was a two two day event with courses the week before and courses the week after. And Richard came grasping this uh, very interesting replica uh, of a of a very o- old plane. Okay, um, and the particular plane it was was it was a Finken plane, and and it, it just looked absolutely um, ornate, marvelous, and, and it was just really really interesting. And then when he started talking about what he does and why he does it, I thought, well, this is fascinating. And then when I saw him last week on here, I kind of bullied him and, and got him to, to come on and do a speak, uh, to, do, to do the speech. So less from me, um, I want to give you the chance to learn um, all about your, your Finkums and your, your Straubings um, and to understand the difference from your Sars and your Goodman Hams. Um, so I'm going to pass you over to Richard, who's going to talk about ancient hand planes. OK, very good. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, well, look, my... my... What started my interest in, in these old old planes was a um, uh, somebody posted on on the UK um, workshop forum a um, a picture of a very old plane which was dug up at uh, Silchester in in England uh, a Roman plane and that, that led to a very interesting discussion about about Roman planes and Roman workbenches and ancient um, ancient tools in general um, and. Uh, I thought it well. Several of us thought it would be interesting to, uh, if uh, to try a, a replica of uh, of this plane. So uh, I ended up making one, um, and then then uh, I, I kind of got a taste for it, and I, I made another and another and another. Um, and uh, Jeffrey will show you some pictures of, the, of of them in their original form in in a few moments, and um, and then I'll I'll show you the the replicas that I've made and, and hopefully we can we can make a few shavings and uh, and talk about them. Um, it seems that the Romans were the first, well they're the first uh, uh, people that we know of definitely that, uh, that had hand planes. We know the ancient Egyptians didn't have them, they had skilled woodworkers but they didn't they didn't have hand planes and there is some written evidence that the Greeks may have had hand planes but there are no surviving examples so um, at the moment, uh, the Romans are the uh, are the originators of, of the hand planes, as far as we definitely know. Uh, Jeffrey, would you would you like to show us the uh, the first slide? Okay, so this is the uh, the, the Silchester plane. It's uh, it's made of iron, and it, it did have wood, but the the wood is gone. Unfortunately, um, plane materials don't survive well uh, underground. Um, iron rusts and, and wood disintegrates, but uh, this, in this case, quite a lot of the of the iron has, has survived, um, and it was 
uh, made of um, essentially of, of three plates of iron, two side plates and a, uh, and a sole um, uh, and a wooden interior and uh, everything was held together by, um, by rivets. So there's four rivets you can see uh, top to bottom and there were five rivets from, from side to side holding it all together. So the wood um, was, um, it, well, it wasn't really an infill. It was it, it, because it, it it forms part of the structure of the plane. So it's more, I would, I would say it was more a, like an iron clad than, a, than an infill. So that's the Silchester plane. Um, and we can, we can see the Saar plane next, please. Jeff. So this, this one is, oh, sorry, I should have said the, the size of the Silchester plane. It's about the size of a, um, of a Bailey number five. Um, Okay, we'll go to the SAR plane. Now this is, this is a little plane. This is, this is block plane size or, or, or even smaller. It was, uh, it was found at, um, at uh, SAR in, in Kent. Um, and the original ma material was, uh, was uh, bronze for the sole and the, 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 uh, the body of it was made of, of what is it, horn, I think. Uh, yes, horn, yes. So that's why, that's why it survived. Um, and um, the well, I, I made two of these. Um, I think it was probably Jim Hendricks that uh, that drew my, my attention to this one in the first place. So uh, anyway, I made I made two two copies, and and Jim's got one, and I've got the other, and you can see mine in a, in a little while. Uh, I will move on now, please, Jeffrey, to the good man and plane. So this one is the good man in in, in Yorkshire. Um, as you can see, it's uh, it's got a, an iron sole which is cut, which is sort of turned up at each end like a sledge, uh, and it's got a body. You now the body was made of ivory, so this would have been a very costly plane, um, and because it's ivory, it's it survived, um, and the the body is is held uh, to the uh, to the base by uh, by iron rivets, as you can see, um, and in this case, the iron has, has survived as well. Uh, and the cross pin. The, uh, all these uh, ancient planes that I've discovered so far, um, the, um, the iron has been held in place with a wedge against a, a, a cross pin rather than, the, rather than um, by uh, uh, pockets cut in the cheeks of the, of the plane as in, in uh, the, the examples that we're more familiar with. Um, so this, this is about the same size as the, the, uh, the Silchest plane. Uh, and now we'll, we'll go on next to the Straubing plane. Um, this one came from Straubing in Bavaria, G Germany, um, and it's uh, about the, it's a, a little bigger than the Saar plane. It's about the, same, the size of a, of a of one of our common block planes. Um, the the most interesting thing about it is is the very low. Um, angle of the iron. It's beveled down, but the, the angle is, uh, is 34 degrees, which so that's just about as low as you can reasonably uh, try and use a bevel down um, configuration. Um, and it, it works really well for, uh, for end grain, as I, as I hope to demonstrate a, a little bit later. Um, okay, so we'll go on to the next one, please. Uh, this one is the Finkum plane. So this one comes from Finkum in the, in the Netherlands. And this was made. Of, this one has got a bronze sole, and it's made of of antler. Um, and again, it's the, the sole is held on with 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 rivets. Uh, the iron is missing, um, and there's there's evidence that there was a cross pin, but that's missing as, as well. And the wedge, all the wedges have been. Uh, I haven't haven't seen any examples where where a wedge has, has survived. So uh, when I've made wedges, I've I've felt free to uh, to make them of whatever shape takes my fancy. Um, so uh, this again is block plane size. So, um, and uh, I'll go on now to the uh, Ebbsfleet Ebbs Ebbs plane, which was found as Ebbsfleet in, in Kent. Um, and this was uh, from the, the period of 8400 to 8700. Uh, and it's, it's, in, it's unusual because it's a wooden, it, the wood has survived, so the, the ground conditions must have, been, uh, must have been suitable for the preservation of wood. But it's, it's, you can also see it's charred, so it's been through a fire at some stage, so maybe it's been thrown away, or maybe it's been in a village that's been sacked by, uh, 
by, by enemies. We, we don't know that. Um, it's not known yet what the what the wood um, was. Um, from looking at close-ups of the photographs, I don't think it's boxwood. My, my best guess is a, is a fruit wood of, of some sort. Um, it's got two other interesting things. You can see it's got a very wide mouth, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. Also on the underneath is a, uh, is a, is a groove that runs sort of diagonally from one, one corner to the, at the front to the opposite corner at the back. Um, and it, it's either been made intentionally or it's been made through, through long wear. Um, and the best guess we have for the purpose of this plane uh, is that it was used for making arrows or very possibly fishing rods, but uh, arrows is the, is the, uh, the favourite guess at the moment. Um, so having, having shown you the ancient planes, I'll, uh, I'll produce the, uh, yeah, yes, here, here's, here's the complete set of, uh, of, of ones I made up to now. Uh, and the, the little effort you see on the on the right is is what's called a thumb shave. It's it's, it's a pocket um, draw knife effectively. Um, and the origin origin so the origin original copy original example of this was found in, in York, and it dates from a, from about the ninth to eleventh centuries. So uh, right. So Jeffrey, if you give me the, the camera again, I'll I'll turn it down so that we can. Uh, we can look at my pen. Oh, right, so yeah, is my is my bench visible to there? Yeah, it looks like it is. So this is the Silchester plane. It's very heavy. It's about the size of a Stanley or Bailey number five, but it weighs more than a, than a, a number five and a half. It's it's very solid. The um, the base is quarter inch thick, uh, mild steel, and the cheeks are um, uh, the side plates are made of three sixteenths um, mild steel. The, the original would have been made of wrought iron, but mild, bright mild steel is the um, is the best substitute that, that I've been able to find. Uh, the the wood that was it was this. Um, originally made of isn't isn't known, but I I used some new simply because I had a, a well seasoned block, um, and I've given it a, an iron made of O1 steel. Um, we know that the Romans were capable of making tooled steel in small quantities. Um, so I'll attempt now to make some some shavings. Um, <laughs> It works really well on on hard uh, on hardwood and coats well with, with difficult grain, but it's uh, it's it's almost useless on softwood. So I don't think it's a jack plane at all. I think it's more like a, a panel plane. I think the Romans would have had um, would have had uh, equivalents of our jack plane, probably similar in style to this, but made of only of wood. But they haven't survived. So, the Silchester plane. Next one I've got here is the, uh, the little star plane. Now the original, uh, the it was the original one was made of horn with a with a bronze sole. I've made this one a boxwood with a with a brass sole. So we'll have a go using this on a piece of apple wood. So it's hard to know what this one is for. What I use it for is uh, is luthery. I do a bit of musical instrument making, and it's a it's a very handy size for uh, for some of the operations in instrument making. So other uses, well, any small sort of woodwork really could even have been made for used for. Uh, for arrow making, some people have suggested that, but I think the Epsfleet plane that we see later is is a much better arrow making plane. It's a delightful little plane to um, 
uh, to use. So we'll go now to the good man and plane. So again, this this is a plane with a um, with a very high angle uh, blade, sixty degrees. Um, got a cross pin like all the others. I've given it, given it a, a wedge of uh, ebony simply because I had an odd shaped lump of, of ebony that uh, that I felt like using. Um, the original was was ivory. And now, even if ivory was really available, I wouldn't want to use it. Um, and I've used um, some holly wood, which Jim Hendrix kindly gave me. And it's kind of an ivory colour, and it's got a bit of a, a grain to it that is sort of a bit like ivory. But it's a it's a hard, close-gained timber, good for uh, uh, plane making. And we'll have a go at some shavings. I'm trying it here on what I think is a is a piece of uh, walnut. Again, it works very well on 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 hardwoods, and again, it's um, almost completely useless for the softwoods. So I think this was a a high status, high cost plane in its day. Um, it's got a front handle, which it's the only one that. Well, I've seen I've seen uh, pictures of other examples of uh, from that have been found in Italy of planes with uh, with a front handle as uh, as well as a back handle. All these ancient planes are made of one piece. None of them. The I don't know when the idea of putting a, a separate handle um, occurred, but um, certainly not um, not before one thousand AD. I've given them all a nice tight mouth. I don't know whether they did have a, a tight mouth, but uh, it's um, it's easier to make it bigger if if I discover that I'm historically wrong, but but uh, not the other way around. So we come now to the Straubing plane from Germany. This one I've made of, of the view. Uh, the, the original one was made of uh, antler. I don't know where you get a piece of antler big enough to make um, such a plane. Some sort of moose antler, I suppose, or elk. Um, got a very low, low angle blade, as I, as I mentioned before. So I've got here a piece of um, end grain mahogany. So we'll have a go at uh, making some shavings of that. There we go, some nice end grain shavings there. Uh, Reminded when I saw Richard Arnold's presentation recently on this uh, um, Bench Talk 101, um, he, he was talking about um, uh, the strike block plane, and it, it reminded me a bit of that a bevel down plane at a low angle, good for planing end grain. What are we doing for time? Okay. So next one we've got is the Finken plane. This is a very, this is the one that, uh, that Jeffrey was talking about before. I took it to the uh, the exhibition last October. So as you can see, it's uh, it's a it, it's got a very ornate bear end. So my copy has got a bronze sole, and I made it a boxwood. So again, about the size of a block plane. So 
nice on a bit of apple. Works very well. I gave it a fine, a close, tight mouth. Makes lovely, lovely shavings on apple wood. It's a, very, it's a pleasure to use this one. It's a, and, and a pleasure to handle. So, don't know what its original purpose was, but uh, again, it must have been a costly item. It, 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 the plane doesn't need to have an ornate uh, um, decoration or carving like this, but it's a that's a, an interesting object, I think. Come now to the Ebbsfleet plane. Which I think was used for arrow making. So as you can see, it's about the size of a block plane, but it's got a narrow blade of about five eighths or three quarters. And you can hopefully you can see underneath here the the the, uh, the groove that's worn worn or deliberately made on, in the underneath of it. I discovered that this plane. Well, I found out about the the um, the ori original plane uh, at the uh, same exhibition that I took the Finken plane to in October last year. Um, Richard Arnold uh, was there, and he introduced me to a gentleman called Bob Williams, who's a um, a retired um, archaeologist and also a collector and user of, uh, of tools. Um, he told me about this plane that had been, been found in uh, uh, in Ebbsfleet in Kent, and he uh, he, ca he kindly later sent me um, photographs and information about it. Um, and so I made two two of these. I gave get one for myself, and I, I gave one to Bob. Um, and uh, Bob was very interested in it, and he's he, he's. Uh, Thought about the possibility of the of he and I collaborating on a, a um, an article for the uh, Tools and Trades Historical Society um, newsletter at some point. So about this plane. So let's have a go at a bit of arrow making here. This is what the purpose of the wide mouth is. You can instantly poke out the shavings. If you're making arrows by the dozen all day, and you can you can instantly uh, uh, eject the shavings, then you're going to save time compared with stopping and poking them out with a uh, with a sharp stick. So a fun thing. So Jeffrey, we've nearly come to the end of the uh, of the object I want to show you today. Um, this here is the so-called thumb shave, and it's a it's the pocket um, draw knife. Now I'm not a very skilled draw knife user, but I'll try and make a few shavings with this here. So it works. Might be handy for a, a traveling arrow maker to uh, to have in his pocket as well as, well as a um, as an Ebbsfleet plane. Oh, just one one thing I'd like to see, one more thing I'd like to show you. And I need to tilt up the camera for this. This is a work in progress. This thing here. Is going to be, I hope, a copy of a one of the planes that was uh, found uh, in the Mary Rose, the ship that sank in the Solent, belonging to Henry VIII. So this is a quite a big plane. It's about the length of a number seven. 
and it's uh, it's made of ash. And see the back end is the handle is offset, which reminded me of some of the um, of the uh, 18th century planes that uh, that Richard Arnold has um, investigated and and made copies of. And the front end has got a an integral front knob. And it seems that the original plane was made out of, all made out of one lump of wood rather than having the handles attached in some way. So when I complete it, I, I can maybe show it at the end of one of these uh, one of the future meetings of this group. So I've been talking for about half an hour now, so uh, I guess we can we can stop the presentation and uh, and ask for questions. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Managing to try and get the angle of the camera onto the plane and onto the bench, um, you're the first person that's achieved it. So uh, well, well done for that. Uh, okay, so we'll uh, we'll go to questions. Um, and what we've been doing with the questions is uh, if if uh, we can um, uh, if you put your name in the chat box. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll go to the chat and then you can unmute yourself and then, and then uh, ask the question um, as you go. So uh, but, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, my, my favourite uh, uh, at the moment is, is looking at that Ebbsfleet plane and, and just the way that you seamlessly went down the arrow covenant. I, I think you could probably whittle that away for, for hours. It looked rather, looked rather good. It looked rather good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a satisfying thing to play with. <laughs> so um right we, we've got our first questions coming through um and i've been asked this time to to put the um the question people on to speak of you uh, so that we can we can see them um on everybody um and the first person chester's beaten us all again so chester um up for the first question hey that was uh that was terrific am i unmuted you're unmuted we can I, I can hear you chester okay that was uh that was terrific i mean uh i have a whole list of questions so I won't, okay, I'll try. Yeah, I won't bother you with all of them, but um, when you showed the um, Goodmanham uh, plane, the one that had the rivets and the ivory, I thought it was interesting that that had the similar uh, rivets to the Shilchester plane. Yes. Uh, so I, I thought that was interesting that the two had that in common. And on your reproduction, you made the pockets go all the way through. Yes, and that was one of my questions was um, on the original, it looked like it was solid in there and maybe there were just pockets on the side that you held and not that they extended all the way through. Okay, if, uh, uh, if you see, if you see, uh, well, I, I don't have any um, photographs um, handy of, uh, of the original one, but I have seen views of it where you can see straight all the way through. So. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it's correct as uh, as I've made it. So, uh, how did you decide on the angles for the blades? Let me just give you all of these, and then I don't have to stay on here. How did you decide on the angles for the blades? And um, and I noticed on the sare sare, am I pronouncing that right? That you extended the sole forward, and I didn't think that was like that on the original. And then, how did you get the dimensions? And um, have you handled them all? Were they were they were they available to you somehow to do the measurements, or did you have somebody measure them for you and and uh, give you all that information? And I'll leave okay. you. It, it's, uh, well, I, ha I haven't had the been able to to examine any of them personally, uh, so I've had to rely on on uh, on reports from from others. So in in some cases, there's there's some there's quite good information. So that for the SAR plane, there is. Uh, um, there is uh, detailed dimensional information for it. Um, uh, other planes, the such as the uh, the German or the Straubing one, all, all I've got been able to find is uh, some information in in some photographs in uh, and some brief information in German. Um, and for that plane, what I had to do was um, uh, basically do, do geometry 
from the from the from the photographs, which uh, because there was an angle, I, I, I had I had to work out what they would be in in plan and elevation. And for all the planes, I uh, I start off by gathering as as much information as I can, and then I set out to make a a, a scale drawing, and then I I choose what materials I'm going to use, build it, and uh, and test it. Terrific. I think you've answered my questions. Um, I'll leave I'll leave this to other people. Oh yeah, you, you're asking about the about about the the angles of the um, the angles uh, of the place. Yeah, yes, it, in yeah, it, in just about all cases, the um, the information that I've um, I've found in, includes the the angle of the iron and the extension of the sole on on one of them. So the star plane, yes, that that that, that is authentic. Yes, there are, yeah. 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 Terrific. I'll leave the platform to other people, but thank you very much. It was a great, yeah. uh, great presentation. Thank, thank you, Chester, for your, your eagle eyes there and uh, your first questions. Um, over to Shrenik. We missed, we missed Shrenik last week. Um, but, uh, over to you, Shrenik, for this week. Hi again, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, what a great presentation. Um, I knew a little bit about those planes because I had done some brief research, but not very much. And uh, I think my my most my main question is really, how do these planes compare to the modern day plane in terms of do you find them to be better or more comfortable to use or are, are the modern day wooden planes say of the 18th and 19th century or even looking at the Bailey pattern planes? I know it's probably a controversial question in, in that sense to talk about metallic planes versus wooden planes, but some of those planes had uh, metal soles. So I think my question really is, how do they compare and are they better? Okay, well, I think one of the first things to say is the uh, the handle at the back of the, of the, of the big ones. Uh, that's, that's unlike modern plane practice, but um, we know the Romans um, had low benches, much lower than the benches that we have. So uh, this, and I've tried on, on, I don't have a low bench, but I have tried on lower benches and it, it, it definitely works better if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're above the plane rather than, rather than behind it. Um, and it takes a bit of getting used to, but it's, uh, it, it's perfectly, um, perfectly usable that way. Um, the, I think I said before, the, these, Planes, the um, the Saar and the uh, and the Silchester, sorry, the Silchester and the Goodman plane have, have got high angle blades, very high, sixty or sixty five degrees, um, and it it works well for for uh, uh, difficult grain hardwood, but uh, yeah, as I said before, it's almost completely useless for softwood. The little planes, they're all. Very pleasant to use. Um, yeah, this this this, this saw plane, I I, I use it uh, in uh, musical instrument making, and it's a, a very convenient size for the uh, for certain operations, such as uh, um, leveling the uh, the ribs with the sort of level leveling the linings with the ribs of uh, guitars, mandolins, violins. Brilliant. Well, thank you for that, Richard. Um, so we've got uh, Jim, Jim Hendricks next. Um, it wasn't a question, it was just to fill in a few more details. Um, uh, Richard mentioned the, the SAR plane. This is my one, which is absolutely exquisite. It's made of the same burr oak uh, that I made uh, my panel plane with. It's an offcut, and um, it, it holds a lot of... Um, uh, memories for me because this is in the Maidstone Museum a few miles from me um, and uh, I think if I'm right um, Bill Goodman of the uh, British Plane Makers fame um, did all the research on on that original did all the drawings from the original from which I believe Richard um, did the copies um, for both of us but he, he mentions, or, 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 or um, Chester was mentioning, um, the, the, uh, the planes themselves. And this does have the, the two, like, uh, infill type uh, lip at the front, as you can see. 
and um, it is a fabulous block plane. It, it is one plane that I actually use um, quite regularly um, to, for, as, as Richard says, um, it, it is, it is, as you can see, it's about, it's about the size of a, a, a long block plane, a bit like about the same size as a Clifton, I would have said. Um, but it's a, a, a really fantastic size and the very, um, it's got quite a narrow mouth on it. So as a, as a consequence of that, it's actually quite fast because the wider the mouth, the more, you know, the pressure you have to put on it. And it's actually a very fast plane for uh, particularly edges and bevels and things like that. Fabulous plane. And this was found in the, um, in the grave goods in, in the village of Saar, I think, which is near Ashford in Kent. Um, and it was buried with the, with the body. Uh, so obviously it was something for the for the for the um, the next world um, and considered a a fabulous piece of um, uh, useful tools. So yeah, uh, just to say that um, the um, just to add those things. Uh, I think Chester mentioned uh, earlier he was interested in the front lips on those. So that's all I wanted to say. Lovely. Thank thank you for that, Jim. Extra bit of knowledge there. Um, okay. So next one is Andy. Andy Tuckwell. Um, well, thank you for that, Richard. You've already answered my first question, which was, uh, does the Roman plane make more sense used on a low workbench? So thank you for that one. Um, but have I remembered this right? There was at least one of these where um, when you were building the replica, you actually found things that the archaeologists' guesses weren't quite right on. I think it's maybe the... Um, Silchester Plain, mm. is that the one in Reading Museum? Oh yes, yeah, that's, a, that's an, an interesting point. Yeah. The reconstruction has yeah. been wrong, but only when you actually go to make the real thing and use it, but you find out the practical details that you don't get just by staring, drawing, and thinking hard. Yes, yeah, that's a that's an interesting point. Yeah, um, I don't know if you you can all see here, but the. Um, the way this plane is, well, the way I've constructed this plane is that we've got a, fr a front, a, a front and a rear block, and um, we've got side plates and a and a sole plate, and and everything is held together by rivets, top to bottom and side to side. So it's I haven't made it like a uh, like like a, a common wooden plane, um, so the. Uh, the construction, in a, in a way, is a bit like uh, like a fabricated wooden plane rather than one cut, carved out of the solid. Mm. Um, so, a little ex example here, which is a a Bob Waring design of plane, which is uh, which is made in a similar way. It's got um, it got a front and a, and a rear block and and wooden side side pieces which are which are glued to it. Um, I did uh, find an illustration made by an, a, an archaeologist archae um, of this plane, and in that he shows um, effectively a, a, a wooden plane with um, with wooden cheeks, and uh, and then the, uh, the side plates uh, fitted to it. Um, when I made my copy, I didn't notice that. I just I just built it in the way that um, as I thought it should be built. Uh, but it, so, but looking back at it later, I, I think I'm I think I'm right. There would, there would be no point in making a wooden yeah. plane and then and then fitting um, metal side plates to it. If you wanted to add mass, you could do it in in in, in an easier way. That, that's what I was trying to remember. Thank you. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, so we've got uh, Anton now. Can, can you hear me? We can hear you, Anton. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, less, a, less a question than, than an addition. Uh, those loopholes in, in the front and in the back, the inset ones, were still common in, it, in Italy up to the 1930s and uh, especially with uh, planes in the Venetian style. 
but also in the in the spiral regions of Salzburg and even some Bavarian regions. So if, if you take away the metal from those Roman planes and, and uh, imagine it as being a full wooden plane, uh, th those are still very similar up to the 1930s, 1940s. This, this only changed around the, the, uh, the Second World War. So just, just yes. as an addition. I have Italian yeah. catalogues. Italians uh, kept a, a big variety of, of different styles of planes until the, the Second World War, from Milano style to Genovese, uh, Genoa style to, to Venetian style. And the Venetian style and the Alto Adige Tyrol style stayed this way up, 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 to, up to the 1930s. There, there are quite some, some uh, Austrian planes mainly longer planes like jointer planes uh, built in this fashion. Now I think you're, you're absolutely right with uh, uh, this being rooted uh, in, in lower benches because uh, if, you, if you look in my back, my bench is no bench. It's a good bit lower. It's not as low as a Roman bench, but it's a good bit lower than, than Anglo style benches. So just as an addition. Yeah. Lovely. Th thank you for that addition, Ant Anton. Uh, Martin. Have we got yeah. Martin? There we go. Hello, Martin. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you for that. That was uh, that was intriguing. Um, how how adjustable are those uh, are those planes and those designs? Uh, well, you, you mean how, how do you go about adjusting? Well, I imagine, I can imagine it's by the by, via the front, uh, but but just wanted to know whether they respond, how they respond, to, you know, to adjustment. Right. So, well, I have here my Yorkshire pattern um, plane adjustment hammer. Um, and to to, dr to drive the, the the iron forward, you just you just you just tap the back of the iron as as normal. But to to it to uh, if you've driven it too far and you want to back it off, then it's it's not quite so easy because of the because of the mass of these planes. It's, there's no there's no good hammering on the on the on the on the on the, the body of the plane. What you have to do is to is to tap the wedge back and forward until it comes loose. Then, then pull pull back the iron, and then tap the wedge right. in again, and and drive forward again. Right. So it's, it's not quite as convenient as as uh, as um, as you as you can do with uh, with modern types of wooden plane, but it's uh, it, it's quite doable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, uh, I think that was really interesting to see the Yorkshire pattern um, adjuster hammer there. A bit of a copper pipe, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Yorkshire Imperial Metals uh, <laughs> a tea piece with a, with, a, with a brass insert on one side and, and a wooden insert on the other. I think that could be the next trend. I think that could be, uh, we, we all ought to have one of them in our toolbox. The, yeah. the Yorkshire pattern by, by Richard Hughes. Um, yeah. so, talking of talking of trends, very briefly, this I I made this thing in I think January this year, and I I showed it on on, on a number of uh, Facebook groups, and I seem to have started a trend. Everybody started wanting these things, and various people have started manufacturing them. Not me, I don't make things for sale, but uh, yeah, it just amused me. <laughs> it looks rather dangerous, doesn't it? It looks like uh, you shouldn't have it in your pocket, you know. <laughs> Um, next one, we've got Mark. Mark, do you, Mark um, would like to ask a question. So, Mark, you need to unmute yourself first. Are you talking to me? Well, it says uh, your name's on the list. You got your, are you asking a question, Mark? No, no, no. Huh? I was just saying hi to everybody. I don't, ah. have a, I don't have a question in particular. Although, since I'm up, Roman plane fascinates me because I know that the Roman legions, Caesar started doing this. You would go to a fortification, you would dig out a huge area, a double trench perimeter, and it involved a lot of fortification engineering, a lot of log peeling, palisades, and so on. Um, 
Richard, uh, do you have any insight as to how these planes were used with uh, a typical uh, uh, Roman legion on the march building Hadrian's Wall? Okay, um, well, the, the, I think the planes that I've, been, that I, um, I've found are, are, uh, have been in, in, intended mainly for, for, for cabinet making rather than, um, rather than uh, site carpentry. I feel that they would have had wooden planes that were um, that were suitable for uh, for use with uh, for, for rougher work and for and for um, uh, for softwood, but they would have been made all in all in wood, as uh, similar to the ones that uh, that Anton was talking about a, mo a moment ago, but with a much lower blade angle, so should we say about forty five degrees, but probably still with the um, with the, the the same style of of, uh, of handle. As uh, um, uh, as the metal ones. Brilliant. Did that, did that answer your question, Mark? Yeah, if you, if you, it did. Thank you very much. Lovely. I, I I've unmuted you, Mark, because um, last week we we had a we had another saw maker on, and uh, he, he was talking a little bit, and and he did mention a word, um, uh, a, a brand called Distant, and uh, <laughs> I. I uh, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking along the lines that uh, I, I have once heard your history of Distan um, and I couldn't get away from it because I was absolutely fascinated by it. And, and the way that you tell stories is uh, rather quite amazing. Um, I'm, I'm going to do the old uh, the, the Bench Talk 101 bullying session now. Mark, next week, would you like to talk about the history of Distan to us? Well, ahem. Let me check my schedule, Sir Jeffrey. <laughs> I believe I can do so. Yes, sir. Lovely. So next week on Bench Talk 101, we got uh, Bad Axe talking distant. Thank you. I would be happy to. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, back, back to Richard Hughes, because this is about Richard Hughes tonight. So off you get. Um, and uh, Richard, um, we've got one more question. We've got Rusty. Uh, Rusty would like to ask a question, so I'll, I'll, I'll mute. Uh, I'll mute Mark and I'll mute myself. And Rusty, if you can come on, that'll be great. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know. If, I have a question, but I also have an observation. I have to say that um, the amount of knowledge and skill and artisanship in this group, and the way you share it with the rest of us, I'm extremely grateful. I, I learned so much from you guys. Uh, the question has to do with the plane that. I don't remember exactly the name, but the one that Jimmy was showing, as he was showing, Jimmy, do, do you mind showing that plane one more time? Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So if you, Richard, if you show it really close, um, as Jimmy was showing it, I realized how much skill went into making this. It looks like the sole and the sides are the same sheet of metal that's been bent up. And then there's this little angle that you filled with perfectly with, with wood. Can you talk a little bit about the process of building those planes? This is very uh, not uh, like the, the planes that I've seen. Um, can, can you talk a little bit more? Like, do you have to develop new skills, learn new things, or um, how did you attach sides to the to the soles and so on? Okay, well, this this one the um, the sole is attached by uh, there are three rivets from the, the pass through the um, yeah you can see the the head of one of the rivets there, and it passes all the way through to the the sole. Yeah. And what you do is um, the, the the rivet is starts off longer than than um, uh, than the thickness of the of the plane, uh, and the 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 hole it passes through in the sole is is slightly tapered, being slightly wider at the at the outside. Uh, so you put the the um, put the rivet through rivet through rest rest the um, the plane on the anvil hammer the rivet until mm -hmm. it spread till it spreads uh, then it's securely fixed and then you file file off the excess so that you've got a uh, a smooth surface underneath. I see. What about the front infill? It looks like so. Is is the sole and the front and the back? Is it the same piece of uh, steel or? Uh, okay, so it's it's made it's made of metal, and um, 
in the original it seems to have been made from from one one piece that's been folded like that um that's quite a challenging fold and i, I confess that i uh, that i cheated so i've i've got a flat piece and i've got an an, an, an l-shaped piece uh, and i pinned and soldered them together and then filed them um and so it's got the impre it gives the impression of being a um uh, one piece that's been been folded like that it looks like a piece of paper that you folded perfectly it's absolutely amazing yeah so uh, but the um yeah the original craftsman who, who, who made the plane seems to have managed to uh, to do such a fold in in one piece of metal how long would it take you to to build one of those uh, I, I don't really know i don't i don't work on them solidly for, uh, or um and until I just do a little bit here and there as I, as I um as I feel like really. And Thank there's you. more work in some there's, there's more work in some of them than others. That's brilliant, brilliant. Well uh, that the insight there and, and uh, you you're right, Rusty, that the, the, the talent in this group is uh is amazing when, when we hear about what everybody's doing. Um Ch Chester wants to, to give a, a comment. Um He's not asking the question, he wants to give a comment, so Chester. Um, number one, what you were just talking about in the folding of that material, it may be that he also cheated um, the original maker as well, but that's not my comment. My comment is on the plane, the arrow making plane and, and, and the groove. And I, and I do believe that it is worn over time to get to that size, but I think it's intentional. And I think it's fascinating on this level, it, it avoids the need uh, like in a spill plane or in any other skew plane where you have to uh, uh, figure out how to turn the blade, uh, sharpen it to the right angle uh, and have the throat properly meet it by making the blade just straight perpendicular to the body of the plane and then doing the groove on an angle, you create a skewed plane, but without having to skew the blade. That's my comment. Yeah, so this, yeah, this one here. So it's, it's, yeah, it, it, it's hard to say whether this, this was, this was uh, a groove that was deliberately uh, made, or whether it was just the, um, um, the effect of a right-handed uh, arrow maker making hundreds and hundreds of arrows and, uh, and, and uh, and worn a groove as he went along. I think what you can say, Richard, though, looking at the way when you were demonstrating it, is that it really does work, and, and that oh, yes. groove helps it to to glide along. So yes, yeah. Even if it was worn over time or intentional, it, it's it's doing a good job, isn't it? So look, we, we've got one more question um, that we, that's being asked, and it's uh, Shrenik for his second round of questioning, um, and then that, that's the last question for tonight. Uh, and we'll we'll leave Richard alone then. <laughs> Shrenik. So so Richard, I think my question is about the the iron itself. So more modern planes use double irons. Now, are the all these planes uh, single iron planes? And if so, how do they actually work to cause the the um, the shavings to sort of curl up? Uh, they 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 are all all single iron planes. I, I don't know when the um, yeah, when the double iron first first appeared, but I, I would guess not before. For the um, maybe the 17th or 18th century, I, th I think Richard Arnold might might be able to comment on on that. But uh, so all, all all known planes before that time have got got single irons. Um, yeah, and they, they 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 work okay. Probably not as as as, um, uh, as the as the as the double iron, but uh, they get round it by uh, having a higher angle. Thank you. So, sorry, R R Richard, did you want to com comment on that? Uh, oh, I was just unmute myself. You're already unmuted. Yeah. Um, uh, as uh, how can I quote Peter Follinsby? Do you know Peter? Everybody. Uh, I think uh, the answer to that one is people that know everything are dead. Um, <laughs> I. I don't think anybody really knows yet when the first double iron was made. My 
suspicion is it's probably around somewhere around 1760, 1770. But everybody keeps asking that question, but nobody's found the answer yet, to be honest with you. But I very much doubt that there was any double irons before about 1750, personally. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, um, Richard, um, that was a, a fascinating talk. And to know so much about the history that's gone on it is, is really quite, uh, you know, really quite amazing. So okay, all that leaves me on, is to, to toast you and to say, toast to the bench. To and the bench. Richard, Richard Hughes, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you, Richard. Cheers. Thank you, Richard. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Richard. Cheers.